Hello. Happy Friday afternoon. We are live. Shall we deconstruct the enterprise event season? I think it would be a good idea. I shamelessly ripped this off from CRM plays yesterday. I was not able to attend their show. So I'm going to do my own little version of this and I expect to have a special guest or two drop in and discuss their takeaways. My theme's a little bit different, I'd say, because what I want to understand is, <laughs> do we actually learn anything that can help customers? That's that's what I'm interested in today. So I have some letter grades. I have like an A, a C, and an F, so I can assign some grades to what I think about some things that happen during the course of this. So I'm um, looking forward to that. And uh, yeah, this is not going to do a whole lot of things like food reviews, you know, obviously food can be an issue at events. We're not going to do like the air travel review, though. I think vendors need to grow up a little bit around air travel. But I really want to ta tackle this from a customer perspective uh, and, you know, not really review it from a media analyst perspective because like, who cares what we think? But wh what do customers get out of these events? That's what I really want to talk about. So, yeah, I just ping some people who may be joining me. And if you want to participate, then just add some comments to the stream on your event reactions for the spring season. And I might actually end up pulling you into the conversation. So just be forewarned that I might invite you to join me if you're up for it. And, uh, hey, you can even do it without the cam because I have a <clears throat> non-cam setup as well. So... Tracy Webster is here. Hi. Yeah, TGIF indeed. I really wasn't going to go live today, but then I was like, man, I really want to talk about events for a little bit. So uh, after all, saw a lot of tarmacs, and I feel like I have a few things to say about what I saw. I really don't want this to descend into another generative AI conversation. I feel like I covered that off pretty effectively last week, and I just wrote another piece on Diginomica today about why generative AI is a evolutionary, not a revolutionary technology. That's in my uh, Oracle piece, but so I really don't want to have a whole generative AI showdown today, but I will if we need to, but I think we all know that, that why vendors needed to talk about that incessantly this spring. So I'd really rather talk about maybe what we overlooked as a result of focusing too much on generative AI, because I think that's kind of important. But anyhow, that's kind of what's on the agenda. Tracy, did you go to some events this spring? I guess we'll find out in a moment. If so, what did you think? I was going to tackle this mostly from a customer perspective, but I'm also open to talking about this a little bit from a, a partner perspective as well. I think a lot of times partners are not included well in events, and especially the most interesting partners and the ones that are offering the best value propositions are often the harder harder ones to find. Oh, yeah, Tracy, uh, your AI weariness indeed yeah so tracy's uh, weary of tired of ai is that allowed yeah it's it's totally allowed and just as an explanation like the reason that i am compelled to write about it is because customers like want answers and stuff and i get that so that's that's sort of the difference between like why i write about ai and not like blockchain and the metaverse and stuff like that but i totally get why you're sick of it totally understand even Alexa's sick of AI. Alexa, please don't respond right now. Cool. Um, <clears throat> so uh, while I'm waiting on a few more people to show up, shall I shall I assign a few letter grades to various aspects of the spring conference season? From a, now, I'm going to try to do this from a customer perspective, not from a what does John Reed want out of an event perspective, because I don't think that's really, really fair. Um, I try to improvise mostly and try to make every event a good event, no matter what happens. Um, I will say that I think we need to kind of move on a little bit from the it's so great to see each other cliches. It is great to see each other. It was a blast. But, um, you know, before the pandemic, events were in dire need of reinvention. And so I think now it's time to kind of accept that and and start thinking about how can we make events better instead of like, oh, so good to be back to normal again. Well, normal wasn't all that great the keynotes were insufferable. The DJs were too loud. <laughs> there was less peer to peer experiences of informal discussions. And in general, I think there was a lot of lost opportunity to make events more creative. So let's get back to that discussion. Tracy says, 
the shows. I love them because I get to see a lot of my friends, but it feels like they're getting so big. The real conversations don't seem to happen. Exactly. Bingo. But you know, even a big event can have like small group facilitated experiences and peer to peer interactions. So, um, Tracy, by the way, how many events did you go to this spring? I'm kind of curious. Um, but, um, even a large event can have various kinds of peer to peer experiences and stuff. And to me, that's like always the gold. Like, so there's two, there's two things at, at events that I think are, are just total gold. And one of them, I remember like when I was putting on a event for SCP financial professionals for a number of years. And I remember the first time I kind of just saw a bunch of financials experts, like sitting in a circle, kind of talking about the kinds of things they care about, like, trashing the vendor a little bit around things that were problematic, discussing what workarounds, how they got things changed, how they got input on a product roadmap. I'm sitting there saying like this peer to peer discussion, this is like absolute gold. So I think that's gold. Um, now Tracy says, uh, I had quite a few virtual events during COVID, uh, where the networking piece, uh, okay. I think you missed something there about the networking during virtual. And then I try to do at least one a quarter. Okay. Well, Tracy, if you want to uh, come on at some point and discuss that, let me know. Um, I have at least one guest who's going to be joining us surprise guest. So I think at the bottom of the hour, so Tracy Webster, oops, distracted. Yeah, no, no worries. We're, we, we are a multitasking bunch here. So let me uh, let me assign a couple letter grades. How how about that? So I'm gonna assign. I, I've only got three letter grades because I, I didn't have much time uh, to to prepare for this. Oh, Tracy says she's elaborating on this past comment. Let me get this in. The networking piece was better thought out to make it work. Yeah, I mean that's that's the thing is that the kind of peer to peer networking I'm describing, like when you want to do it at scale, you do have to like think through it a little bit. I did see some really good examples of that this spring which was cool. Uh, one was at uh, Salesforce Connections where they had sort of this, uh, uh, I'm not going to get it name quite right, but it's like a circles of success thing that were these small group facilitated roundtables and it was super interesting. I mean, it's just, you know, just general kind of thinking through, there's not one right way to do this, but, you know, that kind of informal gathering of customers. Zoho did a really nice job at, at a localized event that I went to with this too, where you're just sitting around the table kind of sharing war stories, but sometimes around a structured theme or topic or challenge. And, um, sometimes a little facilitation does, does have to come into the mix, but oh my gosh, I mean, the, the comparison of that kind of discussion versus like an over moderated panel is like night and day. Um, and you know, I, I think it's tough for vendors sometimes because it, they want to believe that they have to put on a big production and show. And it's a little bit, takes a little bit of humility to say, we did the hard part about getting all these great people in the same room, but now we have to step out of the way and let them connect with each other and make that happen. That's a, I think that may be a little bit humbling, but that's what event organizing is about, is about you know, making it all happen and then having the, the non-ego, the lack of ego to say, okay, now it's yours. Take it over. Um, Tracy says, some of the regional or even local things seem to be better, informal, but guided. Yeah, exactly. I think there's also a little less like newsy agenda and pressure that vendors feel to make their events like super newsworthy and stuff. All right. So I'm going to assign a letter grade to the hybrid aspect of events. So, and I'm going to cheat a little bit and I'm going to give two different letter grades to the hybrid component. So the hybrid component would be like, especially for these larger events, how well are vendors doing and including people who can't be there on the ground. Because this notion that you have to be at an event in order to really be taken seriously by the vendor is really wrongheaded for a variety of reasons. There's a lot of reasons why people can't get to events, whether it's uh, right now there's a reality of budgets for customers where they're not able to send the whole teams as much this year. Uh, there's all kinds of different reasons why you might not want to go for various health reasons, including continued COVID stuff. But it's not just that. It's just all kinds of things that prevent us from getting on the ground. So how well do we do about including people who are not on the ground and creating a more hybrid structure? And I write about how to do this all the time on Diginomica. So feel free to check out more. So I'm going to do a split grade. <clears throat> so I'm going to assign an A. I'm giving out an A. How about that? For 
session replays and access to educational sessions online. Now, this A might be a little bit generous, but like I told you, I only have an A, a C, and an F. So I didn't have a lot of time to prepare for this show. So <clears throat> I'm giving out an A. I think vendors are making a lot of progress in making show content accessible to those who cannot attend the show itself, including things like toggling between like live and recorded sessions. There's still a ton of problems with how this is set up, including like de-emphasizing the virtual component so it's hard to find before the show because they want you to they want to trick you into registering on the ground, all this stuff. But actually I think the session content is getting a lot better. And so I'm gonna give an A to that. Um, Tracy says, be the one that shows up on a stage with a guitar and no gimmicks and is just fine. Indeed. Exactly. Less pre-planned production and more kind of thinking through how to make it possible for people to come back from their events and bring back to their teams the things they need to get smarter and better. It's not... It's not that hard, actually, but it does require some facilitation skills, and I, I've had a lot of conversations with event organizers and, and some of our clients around this as far as things like, for example, like if you do have more informal discussions, there is the tendency for so-called alpha personalities to take over those discussions, and so there's a bit of a shift in emphasis from entertaining people to figuring out how to facilitate discussions in a way that makes people feel included and they have a voice, and so some of that does take some skill. Um, but these are not, these are not skills that are impossible to cultivate and learn inside of organizations. And a lot of community type people inside your organizations already have some of those skills. So it's just a matter of elevating them. So the second part of my <laughs> hybrid events grade is about including people in, in a hybrid or virtual structure in a more interactive way where they can interact with each other, interact with, uh, folks from the vendor to get information here, I'm going to award an F. So, unfortunately, my A grade has to be counterbalanced by an F. And uh, sorry about that, but it's just not good enough yet. So, I hope that someday it will be good enough, but it's not at the moment. So, sorry. I, You know, right now what you have is you have like these massive keynote streams like that are supposedly watch parties and basically all it is is people like saying hi and waving hands and saying where they're from and then hitting on these ridiculous emojis like loving every single comment it's like a vendor will be like you know we have the best friggin software in our industry and then everyone hits like the heart and the love sign i mean that come on that is like absolutely useless interactive <laughs> that's just sorry but that's a, that's an f that there are much, much better ways to include people than that. So I'll just have to emphasize that. No means no. Yeah, that's that's not good. It's just not good enough. So anyhow, sorry, vendors, but I've got to give you an F on that one. So I'm trying to think what else I really want to give a grade on at the moment. Uh, yeah, yeah. Tracy's like, it's a virtual happy hour. Yeah, I've been to some of these. It's like, come check our interactive event. And it's like a bunch of people saying, hey, hi from Idaho or whatever. Hi from Montana. This goes on for like 30 minutes. It's like, oh my God. Um, but actually, in theory, a watch party can be pretty cool. And in fact, um, Sierra and Playa's, those guys, Brent and Paul, they actually do that pretty nice job, I think, of like having more of a like a moderated discussion of the keynote where people are kind of like chatting in a more focused group online. And it's just interesting how it has, it, well, I don't understand why it has to necessarily be like third parties that organize the most interesting interactive stuff, but I think that's pretty cool. And part of it is just this, the realization that the keynote content is going to be available later. So it's not actually rude to talk over the keynote. It's actually interesting because you can always get the specifics of the keynote on replay if you need to. So hearing the reactions and kind of shooting the breeze or however you want to call it with, with your far flung peers, that's interesting. And so I think supporting those formats is cool, but there's just so much more that can be done. And you, you, you think about a community of peers where it's like, how great would it be to log online to an event and meet you know, 10 other people in your region that you could possibly create a local event with or meet 10 other people in your same job role across the country or 10 other people in your industry. Th these are not like impossible things to solve. So anyway, I had to hand out a letter grade of F for that. 
All right. So how about, I, I will talk about generative AI for a moment since just about every vendor talked about their generative AI news on the stage. And I do want to say that I'd like to get back to the point. We had a really nice thing with the SaaS industry for a while where vendors were really focused on announcing functionality that was generally available. And we've kind of fallen off of that, which is kind of disappointing because, you know, this whole thing around when you announce stuff that's not generally available, you create kind of this frenzy uh, as people try to figure out like, okay, they just announced something. Is it in beta? When will it actually be available? It's like they sent us all scurrying customers, media analysts, everyone to try to figure out when's this going to be released? When's that going to be released? All this kind of crap. So the really cool thing about the SaaS industry was that it started to change that and people would be like, and all of this stuff is generally available today. And I thought that was really cool. And now we've totally, partially because of generative AI, but this this started actually before then, we've gone away from that. And now vendors are announcing stuff and we all have to then figure out when the hell are we actually going to see it in the hands of customers. And that's really irritating. Um, so Thomas... Uh, hiya, how are you doing? It's been a little while. We have a lot to catch up on. Um, I'm doing a little informal spring event rehash, Thomas, and you are welcome to provide your input since I know you went to a few events to say the least. If you would like to hop on for a few minutes and discuss, you are welcome to do so. Just let me know and I will send you an invite link. Tracy, yeah, if you're missing out, but it, it you know, now it, what is creating an alternate fear, which is fear of your event. What is that spelled? Like fear, <laughs> F-O, uh, I can't spell it out. Fear of your event is is what's being created instead, which is I'm afraid of your keynote and all the stuff you're going to say that I'm now going to have to figure out, like, when is this available? When is that available? It's really annoying. Anyway, so <laughs> with that said, I'm going to grade vendors on how well they addressed uh, generative AI during their keynotes. Oh, Thomas, you're on a mobile and on the road. Okay, no worries. Well, feel free to chime in on the chat whenever you uh, don't uh, get other people in trouble in traffic. But other than that, we'd love to hear more of your comments. So, okay, my next grades. And reminder, I only have an A, a C, and an F, so these are not too subtle. I'm going to grade vendors on how well they addressed the issue of generative AI in the enterprise. So by that, I mean things like... Uh, guardrails, hallucina hallucinations, customer privacy, intellectual property, um, all the different pieces that have created obstacles for generative AI adoption in the industry, lack of access to large language models, how customer data is going to get trained on those models, all that stuff. I'm actually going to give a C for that. I'm going to give a fairly strong C the only reason why I'm not going a little bit higher on that is because I feel like there was just a lot of lack of clarity on when the functionality would eventually be there and also what the functionality isn't good for, what the limitations of the technology are currently and, and in, the, in the near term. In this piece I wrote on um, Oracle AI today, I talked about why I think this is an evolutionary, not a revolutionary technology. I'm not going to get into that too much at the moment, but the point is that some precision around these terms is really necessary. And I thought vendors overall did a really good job of seizing the opportunity to explain why the enterprise can actually be very relevant to this type of AI by applying a lot of the responsibility factors, including explainability, where content is, is sourced and derived, all those things that are kind of missing from the sort of uh, prematurely released generative AI models like chat GPT. And I think most vendors really got a pretty strong C. Some got into the B's and B minuses somewhere. I think uh, probably Adobe got the top grade. Adobe, by the way, is not a partner Diginomica, so I can totally feel okay about saying, I thought Adobe showed the best and most comprehensive approach to thinking through the IP related issues and the ethical related issues around sourcing training data and compensating creators and all that stuff. I don't think they have it perfect, but um, I thought they did the best, but in general, I thought vendors did, did pretty good on this overall topic. So it's a C, but it's a, it's a strong C. There might even be some C pluses and B minuses in there. So while we had to listen to way too much generative AI talk, at least the talk I think was, was pretty precise and capable, and it showed that vendors' past AI investments have paid off to some extent because even though they weren't really ready for the generative AI onslaught, 
this spring, they, from a product perspective, they were prepared to talk about it at least. Um, now, as far as when this stuff is going to be available, I, I, I've said a few times that I think actually next spring is when we're going to start to see meaningful, gener, gener, generally available generative AI product. So that means, unfortunately, we're going to put up with a lot of keynote BS this fall around this topic uh, as vendors continue to try to roll this stuff out. Um, it, it's not really going to be until the spring that we really see, I think, a bunch of generally available stuff to kick tires on. Like the Oracle announcement that I wrote about today is a good example because they've committed to the, having the stuff they talked about being available by the end of this calendar year. So I think that's a pretty good time frame for the more aggressive vendors as far as what they're trying to do. Now, for the grade on to what extent did vendors highlight meaningful customer value that they're achieving in the present moment that is not about generative AI, but about other forms of innovation that they're pursuing. To what extent were those also highlighted? I think you know where this is going, but I'm going to have to do it anyway. That's an F. So, so I thought there was a really poor balance between talking about the future and generative AI and sharing, like realistically speaking, some of the really cool stuff the customers are doing now across a whole range of technologies and areas. So that was a pretty big surprise and disappointment to me. And um, I'm not really sure why we kind of lost track of the idea that customers having success in the present moment is a, is like a bad thing to talk about. Uh, but, but that was, a, I'm going to have to do the F for that. And you know, what's interesting is that I would kind of find in the hallways and in the back channels at these shows, customers doing some super interesting eye opening things. And I would be like, wow, like how come we didn't hear from you on the keynote stage? That would have been really cool. And we just didn't. So anyway, I think that was a little bit of a, a little bit of a downside to what we, to what we saw this, this spring from a cut from a customer perspective. So I guess what I would want to get across in this chat is that it's really worthwhile to dig into that stuff and, and to find out, you know, how customers are achieving success in, in technologies that are more readily available now, which by the way, includes some forms of AI, like shop floor robotics. Some of the best conversations I had this spring with customers were about what they're doing on the shop floor with robotics that are, that are just more mature than generative AI in an enterprise context. And sitting there having those conversations, you're like, Oh my God, like, why don't we talk more about this in a, in a broader, broader way. And there's all kinds of stuff happening in various areas. I talked with some really cool retailers at a different, at a couple shows that were like doing really cool stuff to take on the, the behemoths, like the Amazons of the world. And that's really encouraging to see. And a lot of it had to do with like, more cutting edge social commerce strategies and using, um, you know, more mature, uh, shop fronts like shop Shopify that are much more competitive from a user experience standpoint with Amazon than the classic kind of like Yahoo type in your credit, like storefront kind of vibe. So it's really kind of cool to see that kind of thing happening. And I think vendors just have to get a, have to get an F on that as far as their ability to follow through on, on this other, sort of active value creation that's happening. So what else do you want me to grade on? Because I have a bunch of different things. I said I would not grade on the food because I think that's kind of unfair. Um, I, I, <laughs> I'm not going to grade on the, on the travel and logistics, but I do want to say that, that I think vendors need to have a little more appreciation for how tired and exhausted people are when they arrive at their shows because tra air travel is just kind of a beast these days. So I think maybe taking that into account from a planning standpoint can be helpful at times as far as like, yeah, maybe people don't want to get up at seven in the morning, the first day of the show, uh, you know, after they've been like grueling and grinding to get, get here. So I think some putting a little more thought into the friction that takes place to get to and from events is like a really good Good idea. So anyhow, that's like something I'd like to see, but I'm not, I can't really grade vendors on that. So, uh, any other grades that you want me to give out? And, uh, and I think in a few minutes, I'm going to have a guest join as well to give their take. So anything you want to hear in the meantime, Tracy says the really loud DJ in the fall show was horrible. I was trying to talk to people and it was laughable. Yeah. You know, I think it's really interesting how the loud DJs in the hall really, really sort of bring this sort of conflict to a head. And I, th I think it's interesting because like 
vendors really feel self-conscious that they want people to like feel like they're like, hey man, I'm having so much fun at this show. And so it's like the uh, elevation of entertainment. And it's it's kind of too bad because now I do think that a lot of customers still enjoy like the, the traditional sort of celebration night, like party. I think still like that. But in general, the vibe of the shows right now is not, it's not the same as pre-pandemic where it was kind of like, oh my God, let's party. It's much more of a vibe of like, wow, like we're facing all kinds of various kinds of disruptions, whether it's supply chain, political, climate. You know, I, you know, I got to a couple shows this spring where it was like, oh, I just inhaled a bunch of smoke because there were like Canadian wildfires, like, you know, hovering smoke over my city. When you get to events like that, there's a certain kind of like, it's not that you don't want to have fun, but it's more that there's this specter that the world is something of a serious place right now. And like, I want to equip myself with the knowledge to better cope with that world and help my company and help my team cope. And so the DJs in the hall are actually a really interesting juxtaposition of what vendors fantasize that that show should be about versus what customers want shows to be about. So when that networking time is so crucial, like trying to shout over a DJ in the hallway is just is just kind of an embarrassing juxtaposition of vendors just really not understanding like why why their customers are actually at events right now. So that's kind of what I mean about like like moving on from like let's that let's get back to normal to like, let's create something that is relevant to our current culture and climate. And that doesn't mean like throwing out everything we liked about events. It just means we need to have a rethink around why people are there. Tracy says people are tired and weary. I think, I think you're right. I mean, like I was saying, the air travel thing adds to that because with all the kind of delays, cancellations, that vibe, people tend to arrive a little bit more tired too. And so, you know, we just have to respect that a little bit. It doesn't mean that they don't want to be there. It's just that, you know, this kind of like, oh man, I'm here to party my ass off. It's like, no, that's not really it anymore. That's not really why we're here. And, uh, but, but we're definitely here to make human connections. And I think that's really good news, but it's like, look, you got everyone to the same place. Now just let it percolate a little bit, like step back. You don't have to entertain people all the time. Like there's a natural People have a natural affinity for, for community and connection. Tracy says, customers and partners spend a lot to be there. It is a marketing and network event. Fun is great, but this is part of our job. Yeah, for sure. And, 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 and to a large extent, like fun is the connections that we make and, and the creative ways that we can foster those connections. And, you know, that's why I'm really pushing for a creative overhaul of events, both on the ground, virtual, hybrid, all of it, because there's so much more possibility for that than actually happens. Like j- just to give you an example, like I think there's ways of of stirring the pot. Like one of the things I did in a smaller v- event that I used to put on is I, on, on our first day, we would have a sort of turbo networking thing. And the whole idea was to kind of f- people like to socialize, but the problem is that if you kind of just let it happen informally, a lot of times it's the classic where you walk into a networking thing and you're not sure which table to join. And then you end up in a conversation that's a little bit tedious, perhaps, or a little off the mark for what you wanted, but you can't easily excuse yourself. You don't know who else to meet. And it's like, it's cool and it's useful, but it's not hyper useful. So that's where creative event design can really help where we would stir the pot and kind of force people to mingle based on various things where we would, you know, it was kind of chaos, right? Like, okay, find everyone in your geography. There was kind of a gamified element too. I won't go into it now, but like find everyone that shares your kind of role or find everyone that shares your industry. And then we would spark it with some collective questions that people had to answer around like, project challenges and things like that. And the whole point of doing that early in an event is that it kind of forced people to kind of make connections. And the thing is, once you get people talking like that, like magic starts to happen because they kind of overcome their inhibitions and, and, and now they're making connections that they haven't made before. And you've kind of turbocharged that for people. And so there's all kinds of things you can do to an event structure like that to create more whiteboard experiences that are more loosely structured and it's not that hard and it doesn't mean you you don't have to give up on your keynote you can still have your keynote yeah your keynote shouldn't be three hours long but you can still have it but the point is like there's a whole lot you can do to shift the event experience and it's time to start talking about that for the fall and there's so many cool ideas you could put into play there 
And people are like, oh, well, you know, you can't do that at scale. Sorry, that's bullshit. Where's my bullshit button? Oh, there it is. Bullshit. Anyway, um, you absolutely can do that at scale. I remember going to a Domo show years ago, Domo Palooza. I don't know if they still do this, but they would literally have a customer feedback session for the entire conference. Can you imagine that? And it worked. It actually worked. And, you know, some of it was like upvoting of ideas in real time. And some of it was people, you know, having microphones off in the audience. It's a pretty large crowd. And it's like, don't tell me you can't do that stuff. You can. And it's fascinating and it's interesting. So um, the, the, I guess the other thing along those lines is, is sort of redefining customer success and how a redefined look at customer success means a redefined look at events. So in many ways, what I would suggest to vendors is start by redefining customer success. When you do that, your event strategy becomes a function of that. Anyhow, I write about that a lot, so I won't go into that further here. And I'm hoping that my guest is going to be arriving soon. And if not, I will probably wrap in about 10 minutes because I think I've said most of what I wanted to say about the spring event season at this time, unless there's further questions or comments from the group. Oh, and and by the way, I am planning on um, doing more Friday shows this summer that are a little more structured with guests and stuff. It's just I haven't had a lot of time to organize those shows. And I'll be like trying to market them a little more aggressively as well because LinkedIn is constantly making algorithm changes. So I think some of this, like there's been a little less activity in a couple of my more recent spontaneous shows. And that has to do with the fact that LinkedIn's decided that like it's not going to show as many people the the live video is an impromptu thing as it was before. So less people are going to like stumble in. So, but anyway, I'm going to overcome that through more calculated promotions. But at the same time, I think there's also something really cool about just being able to go live. So that's kind of what's going on is sort of experimenting with how to engage people. So um, anyone who does video on LinkedIn, you may have noticed the same thing, but basically it means you're going to have to do a lot more, deeper promotions and count on less live stumble factor, at least from what I'm seeing the last few weeks. So, uh, friggin' LinkedIn, supposedly they're doing this thing to make like better engagement with people around topics that you care about. But you know, these things are always done with like a blunt force trauma. So if you do a Google search on LinkedIn algorithm changes, you can read a lot about this. And in theory, it's supposed to you know, increase the signal, but at at times what it's going to do is it's going to create glitches where you're reaching less people than you used to. And, you know, so anyway, um, one of the things that's also kind of tedious about LinkedIn is that you actually can't subscribe to someone's video show the way you can to like a newsletter. So anyway, that's a little bit too bad because it puts video producers in a position where they have to, um, like basically like spam people with invites, which I really don't like to do. So anyway, I don't know if what I'm going to do about that just yet. I keep telling LinkedIn to create like video subscription thing like they do for newsletters, but they're not taking John Reed seriously at this time on that. Any further comments or questions from the chat? I'm going to give my special guest a couple more minutes. And then if it doesn't happen, we are going to call it good. Just see if he gave me another message here. Please hold. Please continue to hold. Well, if my special guest doesn't show up in the next minute or so, I'm going to call it. Thank you, Tracy, for your avid participation. You brought some tremendous, excellent, additional value to my conversation with myself today. And uh, yeah, like I told you, I'm still winging it a little bit with how useful the impromptu sessions are going to be based on the the algorithm changes and my guest appears to not be able to come in time. So look out for future invites and what you will see is more pre-planned episodes probably because the impromptu stuff probably won't get as much mileage, which is fine. Oh, Tracy, thanks. Appreciate it. Um, So there will be um, more stuff to come, but I'm just going to have to put a little more premeditation into it in order to get to critical mass. And that's just the nature of living in, the walled gardens of the social feeds. Have a great 4th of July. Catch y'all on the other side. Later.